Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. You are all so excited to be here, aren't you? Yes. I just thought I would start low and see if you stayed in the same position, and sure enough. Well, I am glad to be here. Um, thank, thank you so much for being here as well. The thing about church is that it's not just that we all come as individuals to do our own individual thing with God, is we come as a collective family. And that is one of the beautiful things about church. As individuals, we show up, but we are part of a family, a spiritual community. And so we have the opportunity to receive uh, strength in that experience of being together today as we worship God. So. So glad that you are here and that you are a part of this. Um, today is communion, so you heard that already if you didn't just come in. And so we've got some special moments in the service today uh, that we'll get into in just a little bit. But so, so glad that we have the opportunity to come and worship freely today. And it just so happens the sun is also shining, which makes it really nice. I want to tell you a quick story this morning to get into the idea for the sermon today. But before we do that, uh, let's, let's pause and ask for God's blessing. Father, we came to meet with you, and so we're asking that you would speak to us in just the ways that each of us need, and connect us more closely to you, and to your heart, to our Savior, is our prayer in Christ's name, amen. One of the things that we as individuals struggle with is when we try to do something that we can't do and we find out that we can't do it. It's something we don't like very much inside, especially when we have tried to do this thing repeatedly, multiple times on, uh, for, for a period of time and we still are unable to do it. Um, one thing that comes to mind along this line is getting lost and asking for directions. How many of you love asking for directions when you're lost? How, yeah, all the women raise their hands. Um, yeah, this is, this is a pretty common, common thing. The men are like, no, thank you. I don't like, don't like asking for directions. That's why we drive around for a long time, right? So I'm going to tell you a quick story about that. Um, and if you're one of the men that's a little different than, than uh, the stereotype, God bless you. Uh, you're in a much better position than most of us are. So uh, many years ago, my wife uh, and I were on a vacation. My folks were with us. We ended up in a small alpine town uh, in France, uh, close to the Swiss and Italian border. The name of that town is Chamonix. Any of you have heard of that place in the world? Okay, two of you. Um, it is a place that I would say, oh, if you have the opportunity to ever see it, even if it's just in really immersive pictures, uh, it is well worth your time. If you like mountains, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So it is ringed, it's a valley, and on either side are these just humongous, humongous mountains. Uh, certain times of the year, very, very snow-capped. Other times of the year, you can see the glaciers that wind their way through uh, down into the valley. It's just truly beautiful. And the town itself is really a joy to walk around in. Architecture is wonderful. There's, there's a little river that runs through town. And then one of the other things that's really special about this town are all the flowers that grow uh, there that they've planted and just makes it such a beautiful place to go to. I look forward to going back there someday, Lord willing. So we had been in this town for several days already, and I was kind of getting to learn my way around. And one of the things that we often do when we travel is we walk, use our legs, and we walk around uh, since we don't ha often have a car. And so we had been around, and on this particular day, 
we were going to catch a bus and go to a destination to do something uh, on, on that particular day. And I was ready. I was ready. I had a map of the city. I knew where I was going. I knew what time we needed to be there. And I took charge and I was going to get us to, to the bus stop to catch the bus so that we could get to the destination for the day. And so we, we left uh, the accommodation we were staying in out the front door, map in hand, family in tow. And off we went. I was full of expectation. I was full of confidence. Such a good feeling confidence, isn't it? Full of confidence. And so we started walking. And, and the beautiful thing was the bus stop wasn't very far away. Five, six, seven minutes later, following the map, I had this sinking feeling inside of me. Why aren't we there yet? I know where I'm going. This has to be the way. And as time went on, I began to realize that maybe I was mistaken about something. And at that point in time, I recognized that there was a choice that needed to be made. And it was a choice I was uncomfortable with because I was so confident that I knew exactly what needed to happen and how to make it happen. The choice that was coming up inside of me was, you need to stop and admit that you haven't gotten to the destination yet, and it's highly unlikely that if you just keep walking around like this, that you're ever going to get there. And there's a whole plan for the day that involves more than just you. And there's this little thing inside of some of us, it's called pride. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've ever felt that before, but pride says, no, 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 don't admit anything. You got this. You can absolutely get where you need to go. And the other side of you says, but you've already been trying and look at the results. And so I came to a place where I recognized what needed to happen was some humility that would cause me to say, I'm so sorry, I'm not sure that I actually know where we're going, and so far it seems pretty evident that I don't. I need, what's that famous word? Help. Help. Yes. And so that's exactly what I did. And graciously, my family assisted in the process. We actually ended up back at the front door of our accommodation. That was the circle I had led us on. And my wife got a hold of the map and she looked at it. She's really good with directions while we're on vacation. Like, I've learned this finally. My wife got a hold of the map and she said, it's actually that way. Two minutes and we were at the bus stop. I had spent probably 20 minutes walking us in a big circle and it was only two minutes away. And the interesting thing was the freedom that I felt when I finally stopped to admit that I needed help was huge. Because what pride often does is it, it actually binds us up to where we can ask for help. We've got to try and do this ourselves. We can do this. But it's not liberating. Humility to, to actually stop and say, I need help. I need assistance to do something that I can't do. It liberates us. And we often get to our destination much, much faster as a result of it. And so as you, as you think about this, what needed to happen was not, not me just somehow turning the map ever so slightly different. What needed to happen was a change inside of myself. There came a point where I needed to admit something inside. And as soon as I did that, then I opened the door to actually get help, which got us to our destination. And it was a beautiful day. The change needed to happen inside first. The story we're going to look at today in the scriptures reveals this inner dynamic that needs to happen inside of us. And we're going to see two different individuals 
and how that worked out in their lives. Are you ready for this? That was a lot of confidence right there. Okay, here we go. Genesis chapter 4, this is a story that many of us, if we've spent any time in church, are fairly familiar with. If it just so happens that this is an unfamiliar story for you, all the better. But if it's a very familiar story to you, just try and look at this and stay as open as possible to what we see in the text. It is the story of Cain and his brother Abel. Cain and Abel. And here is what, and, and, and just for context sake, chapter three was kind of this whole situation of God talking to Adam and Eve. Things have gone terribly. There's been what we call the fall of Adam and Eve. And now they have left the garden as a result and they are living life now outside the Garden of Eden. That's chapter four. That's where we pick up the story. And Adam and Eve have now had two sons, Cain, the oldest, and Abel, his brother. They have grown up by the time we get into this story to where they have their own vocations. So we have a little bit of time that has elapsed, uh, years and years of time, but we're still really close to the Garden of Eden. This is where I pick the story up. Genesis chapter 4, the end of verse 2. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the the soil. Statement of their vocations. This is what they did. Uh, You could say what they did for a living, but this was really what they did to to, uh, carry on with with what the family needed. Verse 3, in the course of time, that just means at some point in time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as a what? Offering to the Lord. Hang on to that thought. What was Cain's vocation? He worked the ground. He was a farmer, if you will. And a farmer, as a result of what he did in his vocation, he brings some of the, call it the first fruits, if you will, some of the early harvest, he brings as an offering to God. Seems very consistent with his vocation. Uh, Verse 4, the beginning of it, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. What was Abel's vocation? He was a shepherd. So both of these brothers are bringing offerings that correspond to their vocations. So far, so good. This makes total, total sense. The differences in their offerings are simply related to their vocation. The Lord looked with favor. Now, stop for a moment and look at how the rest of this sentence goes. What does God look with favor on, or should I say, who? Abel. And his offering. Notice that it's not that God is looking with favor on Abel's offering only. First and foremost, God is looking with favor on Abel. It's really important for this story and our understanding of it today. And as a result of God looking with favor on Abel, God is able to look with favor on Abel's offering. So we're already starting to see a dynamic at play here within the text that's really important for us as worshipers of God who come into his presence bringing an offering of worship and gratitude. But on Cain, verse 5, and his offering, he did not look with favor. Notice how the text is written on who? On Cain, and then on Cain's offering. So if we follow the line of reasoning that we've seen from Abel, is the problem with Cain's offering or is the problem with Cain? It's a good question, isn't it? 
So what we have, we have favor and we have unfavor, and the question is why? So for probably the past 200 years, I would say, or so, within Christian thinking, there has been a strong line of reasoning that the problem was with the offering itself, that Cain should have brought a lamb because that was what was supposed to be done. You were supposed to bring a lamb that was representative of the Messiah to come who would solve the sin problem that your parents had started. Abel, of course, does bring a lamb. Cain, it was fine that he brought the, the fruits of the ground, but he should have also brought a lamb. The challenge is that up to this point in the text, we don't have strong evidence that all of that had been made super, super clear. And the other thing that we have is the word offering here is not for sacrifice of an animal. It was for normal offerings that could be things related to food. It could be other types of offerings, free will offerings. And so this has led to a, a number of people beginning to reassess this story and to look at it a little bit differently. And I will tell you that I am leaning much more towards the problem not being with the offering itself, but again, as the text is written, the problem is what's happening inside of Cain. And we're going to show some evidence today as to why that is likely the case. I just want you to be aware that there are some, several different schools of thought related to this, and there's overlap between the two, which we'll see in a moment. So God looks with favor on Abel. He does not look with favor on Cain. Now I want you to see the results that tells us a little bit about what's going on inside of Cain. The problem, very likely, is one that's internal, one that you can't see. And here's the interesting thing. When we show up to church, when we come in with our happy faces, no matter what's going on inside of us, somehow when we get to church, we feel like we've got to put on a happy face, right? From an external perspective, we can't tell what's going on inside of another person necessarily. When we bring our offerings, if you will, we come to worship, we can't tell. And so that's why we have to be so careful not to judge people. God is the only one who knows. Let him be God. And let's stay in our lane, if you will, right? God is the one who knows. God is the one who sees what's actually going on inside. And God is the one who can help deal with that. Verse 5, the second part, here's the response of the unfavor that Cain experiences. So Cain was... Interesting how the author writes this. He doesn't say Cain was just angry. He said Cain was very angry. And his face was downcast. Super sour. Super angry inside. What is he angry about? It's a good question, isn't it? What is he angry about? That his brother was favored and he wasn't? Is he angry that God is playing favoritism? Maybe there's some of that in his thinking. Based on what you and I know about God, favoritism is not a thing that God engages in. So there has to be something more that's going on here. But Cain is very angry with God. And guess who he's also angry with? His brother. If God doesn't receive an offering, there's a couple of responses that can happen. One is exactly what we see with Cain. Super angry. God, I came and brought you something and you didn't want it. You didn't think it was good enough and I'm angry with you. That's one response. That's maybe a little bit more of a response of pride speaking inside. The other response is, 
hey, God, what do you want me to know? What's going on that maybe I haven't wanted to see that has brought this result? And notice that Cain does not go there. He stays in the lane of anger. He doesn't actually go to a place of humility and say, hey, God, what's the problem? What do you see that maybe I'm not allowing myself to see? Or God, maybe I know what's going on inside of me and I need your help. And then the Lord said to Cain, I love how God asks questions. He doesn't come pointing fingers. He comes asking questions to draw us out. He says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? Notice what he says next. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? It's a rhetorical question. Of course you will be. What is the emphasis? Something's going on inside of Cain that isn't right. Then God says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain, there's something going on inside of you. And it's not healthy. You have come going through the motions, but I see what's happening inside of you. Something is wrong inside, and you know it too. The question is, are you going to actually accept that reality and come to me? Because it doesn't have to be this way. He says, you must rule over it. It doesn't have to go this way. It does not have to get a hold of you. But unless you are willing to turn, I can't accept your offering because it's not coming from a good place inside of you. This relationship has a problem and I'm here to help you try to fix it. If you know the rest of the story, you know that Cain's attempts to fix the problem was to get rid of the person who was closest to him, and that was his brother, whom he killed that day. That's what Cain did with his anger. And the interesting thing that we learn as we go through life is that what happens inside of us works its way out on the outside in the form of actions. The problem is not so much the action. The problem is what led to that action. And Cain is at a point now where he is harboring all of this inside of himself. And we see this dynamic at play in families. We see it in the news. We see it in business. We see it everywhere. Let's blame everybody else for the problem that's happening inside of ourselves, right? Instead of actually taking ownership of what's happening here. Cain is going through the motions, but his heart is not towards God. He is not coming to bring an offering in faith and gratitude. There's something else at work inside of Cain. And if he's not careful, it's going to eat him alive. Now, let me show you some more evidence for this idea being that the problem is inside of Cain, not so much the offering that he brings. This is taken from Isaiah chapter 1, and it is really a statement about a group of people, uh, the nation of Israel at this point in time, specifically uh, the folks that are surrounding Jerusalem especially. It's interesting that this is how the book of Isaiah opens. It is straightforward with a really strong message to what is actually happening And I want you to listen for where the problem lies. This is God speaking. The multitude of your sacrifices, 
What are they to me, says the Lord? I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Like, this is not what this is all about. I'm not asking you to just go through the motions. Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? People are showing up. They're going to church, if you will, but the attitude of their heart is such that God calls it like they're walking in and trampling upon a sacred space. They're going through the motions. They're showing up. But the way that they show up is completely contrary to what God intends for this kind of a communion experience. He says, it's like they're trampling my courts. Verse 13, as a result of this, he says, stop bringing meaningless offerings. Interesting use of words. Where's the problem? Is it the offering? Or is it what's going on inside of them? Let's keep, let's keep reading. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. What's worthless about them? That they didn't check all the boxes? Or is it how they're showing up? The state of their heart. Let's keep going. Verse 15. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Strong words, right? Even when you offer many prayers, I'm not listening. That seems to run completely contrary to everything we seem to know about God, but it's because of what's going on. What does he say? Your hands are full of what? blood. Not the blood of animals. You are harming other individuals created in my image and then you're showing up and saying that you're worshiping me, the one who created them. God says your hands are full of blood. I can't receive what you're bringing to me. Because the state of your heart that is leading to these kinds of actions is completely contrary to everything that you are professing publicly when you show up for church. God says, I can't hear. I can't receive it. I cannot look with favor on you. Where's the problem? It's inside. So God says, verse 16 and 17, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. God has a solution to their problem. And then we have the famous text that comes later on. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be red like scarlet, they will be white as snow. God says, I have a solution to the problem that's happening inside of you, but I need you to own the problem. And then I need you to come to me with a longing to have me solve it for you. But this showing up business and putting on a face when all this stuff's going on and it's going on inside of your heart, I can't even receive it. The problem is not that they didn't check the right boxes. The problem is that they were not showing up in a place of faith and humility, a place of dependence on God. So now Abel. What do we know about Abel? We know very little, but the little bit that we know is extremely important. We're going to jump over to the New Testament because that's where we find some more information about Abel. And we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. And this section of Hebrews is 
different people in the Old Testament that the author of Hebrews is singling out, these are people that were like heroes of faith, people that actually felt their need of God and lived in a way that leaned them into trusting in his promises. Not that they were perfect, not that they didn't make mistakes, but they knew they needed God and they were honest about that. Listen to what you hear about Abel in this text that is different than Cain. First two words, what are they? By faith. Now we're going to define that in just a moment. But notice how, this is the how statement, by faith Abel brought a better offering than Cain did. Was it because Abel checked the boxes right? Or was it because inside of Abel's heart, he brought his offering as an expression of his faith and dependence on God? That's the direction that I lean based on all the evidence. It was not that Abel just brought a better sacrifice than Cain's, check, it's because of Abel's faith, trusting in God, what he believed about God, and as a result, what he was allowing God to do inside of him. That's faith. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, who was commended? He was. Abel was. He was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offering. Why did God speak well of his offering? Because of what was going on inside of Abel, the state of his heart in which he brought the offering to God. And what was the mechanism? Faith. And by faith, the writer of Hebrews, whom we believe to be Paul the Apostle, by faith, Abel is still what? He's still speaking. He's still showing the way. Living a life of trust and dependence on God, trusting in his promises, trusting in God's heart and in who he is, and recognizing that we as human beings have a problem we can't fix ourselves, and so we come trusting that God is able to because that's what he promised to do. And so when I bring an offering with that disposition in my heart, guess how God feels? Favor towards me. And it's not because I had all the checkboxes marked off. It's because it came from a place of faith. What's faith according to the writer of Hebrews? Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about what we do not see. Confidence and assurance. And even though this is reading between the lines, where is that confidence and assurance ultimately focused? On God. That's what faith is. There are things we cannot see, but because we believe that God keeps his promises, we hold on to it. We believe in it. We have faith in God. And that creates within us a confidence, not a confidence that we know we're going to get to the destination because we got this map turned upside down, but a confidence that God knows how to get us to the destination. And it creates this joyful dependence on God because I know I can't do it myself. And I also know that God is more committed to finishing the work he started in me than I am. And man, that's good news. And he's more committed to finishing it in you as well. 
confidence in what we hope for. What do you hope for? In the big picture, the ultimate hope that you have, that when you see Jesus on the day when he returns, it will be one of joy. And you will be ushered into everything that you could ever imagine. Finally, you will be free and at home. An assurance about what we do not see. There's a lot of things we see in this world going on. And there's a lot of questions. But faith is what produces the assurance that even though we can't see it yet, it is as good as done. That's Abel. That's Abel bringing his offering in a position of faith. That was his statement of faith. God, you are good. We are here still because you are a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace. And I am bringing this offering to you today as an expression of gratitude, as an expression of dependence on you. And I trust that you are going to keep your promise to save the human race. Cain and Abel. What was the difference? I posit to you that the difference was simply the state of their heart. One came in faith and the other came with a whole lot of something else and only God could tell the difference. So what does this have to do with communion? Communion is an expression that can be taken in simply by going through the, the motions. Nobody can tell the difference except God. But communion is one of those opportunities for us to make a public expression and demonstration of our faith in God. Not bringing what we have accomplished, but bringing with us faith in what God has accomplished. Recognizing our dependence on him and thanking him for what he has done and what he will do. It is a statement of faith in the promises of God, in the work of God. And so today we have the opportunity to engage in that expression of faith. And we have the opportunity for God to be able to say, hey, there's something going on inside that is leading you away from me. And I'm calling you today to lift the hood a little bit and to see it. And then I'm inviting you to bring it to me and let me handle it. A statement of faith. And secondly, a statement of faith that we need a Savior and his name is Jesus. Listen to this. This is from a book written over 100 years ago. Mount of Blessings. It's written on uh, the Sermon on the Mount discourse that Jesus gives in the Gospel of Matthew. This is from page 131. The argument that we may plead now and ever. How often is that? Always. Right? There's never going to come a moment when we'll say, ah, oh, it's not, yeah, it's not important. Now and ever... The argument that we may plead now and ever is our great need. Interesting that humility is one of those things that actually paves the way for freedom. Our great need, our utterly helpless state that makes who? Him and his redeeming power a necessity. Dependence upon God for salvation. End of story. That's faith. And so we have an opportunity today to make an expression of faith in God, just like Abel did. 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for these stories from thousands of years ago that speak to the life we live today. People that navigated their way seeking to connect with you and sometimes getting tripped up and finding things going on inside of their hearts that were leading them away from the path of life. And today, God, we want to be people like Abel who show up in your presence, not full of ourselves, but we show up in your presence full of gratitude and faith in you in your promises, in what you have and will accomplish. And we thank you for this opportunity to make a public expression of our faith today. And God, if there's anything else going on under the surface that maybe we have been unwilling to see, we have been afraid to see, we invite you today inside to reveal to us what is standing in the way and asking that you would replace that with dependence on you. And we ask for your forgiveness. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen.